Good evening again. Sorry for that uh, wait. Well, it was worth it because people also wanted to shuffle around a bit, stretch their legs. Oh. Um, we've come to this part of the evening, which is really your part of the evening, um, because it's a panel discussion around your questions. And if you want to share thoughts as well, please feel free to do so. Um, I'll start by introducing, actually, I just want to say thank you for a wonderful, wonderful evening. I'm sure that you agree that it was not only entertaining, but uh, extremely thought-provoking. So I know that you will have things to contribute to, to this section of the evening. Um, let me start by reintroducing Professor Ashwin Desai who you heard from earlier. Thank you so much for your impassioned address that you gave us at the beginning of the evening. We really appreciated that. And I just wanted to say that apart from um, the accomplishments, the many accomplishments that you heard about when he was being introduced, um, he is also celebrated as one of South Africa's foremost social commentators. So welcome, welcome, thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce the playwright, Matthew Hahn, of the play you just heard being read, The Robert Island Diaries. Um, let me just give a, a brief overview of his achievements. He, he has a degree in political science and journalism from the Indiana University in the United States. He is a graduate of the Goldsmiths College and master, has a master's in theater directing program. He is the artistic director of the Common Air Theatre Company. He has worked extensively in the UK and Africa, including working for Theatre for Change in Ghana and Malawi. Welcome and thank you so much for your, for your play. And last but certainly not least is our accomplished actor, Vincent Abraham, who is originally South African Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but has a very illustrious um, acting career here in Britain, has graced our stages and screens. I'm sure you recognize him from um, probably the Kumars. <laughs> but of course, he's done so much, so much more. So welcome and thank you for your reading. Well, I know that while you're formulating your questions, you probably don't need any time, but I just wanted to ask you, Matthew, uh, the, you've spent quite a lot of time on this project, so I'd love you to share with us the length of time that you spent on it. <laughs> <laughs> what kept you going, and you know, why, what motivated you to continue with it, and where you think you want it to go? So I, I always call this my labor of love, because I think I'm entering in my 10th year of knowing about the Bible and, um, and, and, and kicking it around in my head. I must give um, due to my good friend Mark Griffin who directed the play this evening. He yes. uh, introduced the idea. <laughs> he, he introduced the idea to me uh, after reading Mandela's, uh, Sam Samson's Mandel uh, biography by Anthony Sampson and, read, and we both read an article uh, in The Guardian about that time as well about this. Robin Island Bible, and so like any good uh, theater practitioner, I stole that idea huh. and ran, ran far away. Well, I haven't gotten too far from him, actually, because he's you know, still here. Um, so, so, so that kicked around in my head for quite a while, and then uh, in 2006, I said, I'm finally going to do this, I'm going to do this, and, and as has happened with this project throughout the last six years, fortune shined on me, and uh, at that time I said, I'm going to do this, and it just so happened that the, Stra uh, the, the, the Robin Island Bible for the first time was leaving uh, South Africa and coming up to Stratford-upon-Avon, and I was able to see it there, and that's where I was um, able to make contact with Sonny, and then two years later, in 2008, I spent six weeks traveling around the wonderful country of South Africa, uh, and just chasing up men, knocking on their doors and saying, <laughs> my name is Matthew Hahn. <laughs> uh, you have no idea who I am. Um, but I've heard about this Robin Island Bible and some of them looked at me quizzically, like I have no idea what you're talking about and, and all of this, but some of them did remember. Um, and then I talked to them about Shakespeare and about what it means to them, uh, what life was like on Robin Island. 
um, and, and, and so forth. And that's what became this uh, play. Obviously, everything beside the Shakespeare is taken from verbatim interviews that I conducted with uh, eight of the men that I was able to have the great fortune to meet and to interview. Hmm. Um, and it keeps me going because it's an exciting, you know, ex incredibly exciting project. What would you like to see happen with it? Um, uh, well, so I'll, I'll, tell you oh. my, well, I'll tell you what my ego wants it to do. <laughs> my ego wants it to go next door. Um, to the National Theatre, yeah. um, but, but much more importantly, I believe, um, I want to develop work plans or lesson plans or whatever you want to call it for young people around citizenship, social responsibility, and leadership, which obviously Shakespeare you know, gives you on a plate, but so do these men. These men give you lessons in leadership and social responsibility and in uh, citizenship. And I'd like to develop that and have that run alongside the, the play mm -hmm. as often as I can. So, so exposing um, a younger generation to these men. Um, it's, it's quite important to me because maybe this audience is differently, but if you'd walk down the street, people would know Nelson Mandela's name. They wouldn't probably know Ahmed Kathrada. They might know uh, um, Walter Suzulu. There, there, are, there are thousands of men and women in the struggle that are, that are not as well known as, as the men that were portrayed tonight and as, as Nelson Mandela. And that's a key, key part of this play and my motivation to carry on. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, uh, Vincent, mm. uh, being a, an actor, and obviously as an actor, you have a huge relationship with Shakespeare. I mean, that's just <laughs> part of your life. I guess it is. Yeah. Are you, but, but like the characters in, 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 in the play, um, Shakespeare had much more, was given much more um, dynamic and, and, and meaning, um, particularly when I was at school. Mm -hmm. um, not so much as a, uh, as a drama student. Ironically, Shakespeare, as an actor for me, um, Yes, he's there. I, 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 I mean him no disrespect, but being small and brown, there are not many, <laughs> there are not many um, um, great roles that one can jump into easily. Sure. Easily, yeah. it takes it takes it takes um, an amount of um, courage on the on the on the on the in, on the part of a director or a producer. But that's another story. <laughs> but I mean, did, you, did your perspective on Shakespeare shift when you were doing this reading? Did it give you something else? Well, it, it brought back um, a lot of my schooling, my high schooling days, because um, certainly when we were taught, and particularly English, any, any language, there was, a, there was a, a political dimension to um, the way it was taught. I went to the school um, that Neville Alexander, before he was imprisoned, was a teacher at a, mm. a, a school called Livingston High in Cape Town. So there was a, a tradition, a, uh, a legacy that that we as uh, young students, it, it was incumbent upon us to have a sense of responsibility, a kind of civic responsibility. And so any any minor transgression for which we were hauled up in front of the the, the principal or the deputy principal, um, we were shamed into um, believing that we were wasting our time. You know, mm. we had we had we had greater things to do, um, and the most important privilege was that to get in, to get out of this situation or to change the situation in South Africa, we had to get a decent education. Right, absolutely, um, Professor Desai. I just uh, actually I was going to ask you something else. But I'm thinking it's a bit of a known question. You don't have to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted you to share a thought. But anyway, if it's nonsensical, you'll tell me. Um, because in, in your book, you mentioned a quote by Victor Hugo where he said, um, he talked of two books of England, and that is the Bible and Shakespeare. And then you said, due to Sonny Van Katratham's ingenuity, um, these two books mutated into one when they got to Robben Island. Can you just tell me your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, it, it was a kind of reflex to Sonny because 
he, he covered that uh, complete works of Shakespeare in Diwali cards and then masqueraded it as a Bhagavad Gita and, uh, and then was able to keep it. Uh, so, you know, Shakespeare and the Bible became one. <laughs> yeah. um, and so interestingly, I mean, Niall, Niall Ferguson in his book says, you know, the two things that England can be identified with is the, you know, the, the Bible of King James or whatever yeah. and, and Shakespeare. Yeah. But, you know, unfortunately for the English, like soccer and cricket, everybody else takes it and begins to own it and do it better. <laughs> so, you know, he even gets that wrong. Yeah. Besides everything else. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to the floor. Um, I'm sure by now you've formulated some questions. Who is going to be the first brave soul? Fantastic. The man in the suit there in the middle with his hand up. If you could get the mic to you. And if your question is directed to a particular uh, yes, person on the panel. Yes, this is a question panel. for uh, Matthew and... Uh, Vincent, and it's, and it's this. Uh, do any passages particularly stand out as being surprising choices, unexpectedly revealing of character? I can cover the, the surprising one. I mean, again, I'm, I'm new to South Africa as well, but I, I've done my reading, um, and the government Becky choice um, yeah, surprises me, again, just from, from an outsider point of view, because mm -hmm. he is known, and I've read about him as being the hard communist, the hard, the hard, you know, far left and these sorts of things, and for him to choose uh, if music be the food of love, play on, but then, you know, you were talking about, we were talking about earlier about how he loved to, to, to say that as you're going, it, um, Sonny tells a wonderful story about him waltzing up and down the single cells proclaiming if music be the food of love, play on, and I can just, you know, imagine this, 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 this larger than life character doing that. So for me, that was surprising. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, um, Shakespeare surprises. So all of, all of those pieces, in the way that they were dealt with and each of those characters deal with them, it, it surprises me how much meaning they invest in, um, in those pieces that give a completely different um, perspective to um, a kind of um, a received uh, perspective of them. I'm thinking particularly of, 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 of the pieces Hamlet. Hamlet, I suspect, is one of those pieces that every high school student in South Africa got hold of at some stage or another. I know certainly at my high school it was the most popular piece. So I'm not surprised that it was there. But it's surprising how the characters in the piece use it to sustain themselves, to sustain their fellows. Um, yeah. Could I, could I say something? Yes, One of them that surprises me is that line that goes, you know, let the currents take you where it must, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these guys were making history. They were sweep, swimming against the currents. Uh, they were challenging, uh, you know, uh, the basic tenets of a society. Yeah. So it surprised me that, you know, people are choosing lines that seem to be like, you know, we just go with the flow of mm. things, mm. when they were against the flow. Mm. Unless he was already thinking about post-1990, when many people from Robben Island said, there's no alternative. The yes. Soviet Union has collapsed. You know, go with the flow of... Uh, neoliberalism, you know, yeah. unless this yeah. guy was really looking into the future, I don't know. But that was a surprising choice to me. Maybe everything else was taken. As, you know, <laughs> 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 a gentleman just down here in the front. Just get the mic to you. One of the prisoners at the beginning of the play uh, referred to the fact that the sonnets were not like so much as the plays. Mm. And then later on, uh, there was one reference to 122 and 123. Uh, I was just wondering if there was any underlying reason why plays were preferred to sonnets and were there any other examples of the sonnets being picked out as being inspirational? Do you want to answer? Well, I mean, uh, Neville Alexander, once again, the sort of hardline, sort of left Marxist, mm. I mean, he immediately chose the sonnets. Uh, Raymond Mashlaba also chose a sonnet, mm -hmm. and it was about a dark hued woman. And of course, for him, it was about his own love story that he was actually married in prison mm -hmm. when he got to Paul's Moor. And his, uh, uh, his two witnesses, I think, were Nelson Mandela and Walter Sosulu. So there, there, was a, there were those choices made of the sonnets. And you know, I presume just the kind of plays, I mean, if you've got a life sentence, a sonnet is read in three minutes. <laughs> you know, you'd rather read a play. It might take you a whole year. Yeah. 
But we, we, were, we were talking earlier, the, the, the actors, and uh, the three of us were discussing the, the, the sonnets and how, how difficult they are. Yeah. They're, they're, they're in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm not surprised the, um, the Marxists got hold of yeah. it because there's a thesis antithesis <laughs> and creating a, yeah. a didactic analysis, do you know what I mean? And, and it, from an actor's point of view, it's a really difficult um, and, and, and challenging uh, process to grab hold of a sonnet and make sense of it. But the sonnet's about time, oh. mm -hmm. and that's, that's what for Neville captured it, mm. the sense of time and passing mm -hmm. time. Do we have, yes, this uh, young woman here in the middle there? That too. Um, I wanted to ask a question to Ashwin and also to um, Matthew. Neil, is it? Matthew. Matthew, Matthew. sorry. No. Um, Firstly, in terms of when you talked earlier about how there was a reading on Robin Island and people who had been imprisoned there and active in the liberation struggle came along to listen, um, I wondered whether any of the people that went on to hold positions in government were part of that or what kind of, if there'd been a response from the people who were on Robin Island who then went on to become cabinet ministers to the book that you wrote. And also thinking about the nature of the book and the nature of Shakespeare that when Shakespeare would play to large audiences about the theatre, the globe, just along the riverfront, um, how Shakespeare would play to audiences which would include a vast um, range of people from different social backgrounds when Shakespeare was writing. Um, is it the case that your book um, has become popular with people who are part of social movements today in South Africa? For example, people who've been part of the anti-water privatisation campaigns or the big public sector strikes last year, um, and also just quickly to Matthew, whether there are plans um, for the play to be shown in South Africa so that people who are young today um, learn about the history if they haven't already done so um, of what happened. Okay, um, uh, there, are, there are always plans to take this play to South Africa. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult um, process to go through. But, but just referring back to what I said earlier, I, I, I'm really keen on getting South African teachers involved in, in this development of these, these workshops on, on these three key areas. So yeah, absolutely, there's, there's, um, there's plans to do that. And I think it's very important. Uh, you, you know, again, when you talk to, when I did my interviews and I talked to young people my age and younger, they, they don't know these men's names. You know, and I'm, and I'm, and it's you know the same things happening in in the U.S. and, and over here. You know, they they're forgetting their history. they the, the 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 percentage of voters are are dropping already, and all these sorts of things. So I think young people need to rediscover these 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 leaders. Mm -hmm. So yeah, would, yeah, certainly. It's to make a long story short. Yeah, certainly it is. Well, you know, uh, my book is not only about Shakespeare, it's really about the people in the general cells. And for me, one of the most humbling things was just this pursuit of education. And I meet Thompson Garzo, who went in 1963 to Robben Island as a PSC member, and he had no schooling. But when I went to visit him, I'm the first person to visit him to interview him. I mean, his main thing was having the metric certificate. But the innovative ways in which people debated Vietnam and Cuba uh, and talked about the National Democratic Revolution um, Sadiq Isaacs, who I write a chapter on, used to do his own experiments, what was called the Harvard Step, and he would get people to jump off a bench and, and test their sort of uh, physicality. And, and he, when he left Robben Island, he used to sell chicken and eggs on the Cape Flats, and he finished a PhD and became the head of informatics at Krutaskir. Um, and one of the most critical sort of scholars in that field. And uh, just translate that back into contemporary South Africa. The, our universities, we've, we've gone after transformation, but we've not thought about the curriculum. And in fact, a lot of people who are coming out with degrees in South African universities are illiterate. Not because they're bad, because in, in a, there is no South African context in which people are taught. So in psychology, they're still teaching this individual psychology. You know, if you're unemployed, you know, you lie on a sort of bench. And somebody asks, you know, were you abused by your mother as a child? You're not employed. There's no sense of the social conditions and why black people are not finding jobs. Uh, in sociology, we have the sociology of trade unions, sociology of work. There's not a sociology of no work. In physiology, they, they, they teach people from a textbook still. Uh, a balanced diet is two eggs and, and orange juice in the morning. I mean, we're the Braves of Quechuao when they're coming across the hill in 1879 having two eggs in the morning. There's no sense of a, of, of a critical a critical curriculum. And so, you know, in response to what you're saying is that 
part of that history is to start to, start to think um, about our economics are still taught in the most absurd form. And uh, you know, about, it's still about supply and demand and all neoclassical stuff. So the universities haven't transformed to that level. I and mean, not, we're not producing the kind of critical scholars in almost all the fields, ironically, despite the legacy of Robben Island. Mm -hmm. and, and despite the kind of, uh, you, know, you know, despite people copying books late at night, people sometimes missing out through UNISA and being able to register. Um, and, and, and people teaching other people, there isn't that. So it's, it's, it's a real, but it's a debate that's starting to happen now because people realize that uh, uh, knowledge is not power, power is knowledge. And the kinds of stuff that is happening, that we're actually producing a whole generation of people, the more certificates they have, the more stupid they might be. You know? And so there is a thing that is going on. So you know, that influences a whole lot of things. And so in this re... Um, Rethinking of Curriculum, this is a lovely book produced by Natasha Distiller called Shakespeare and the Coconuts, about returning to these debates in a, in a broader fashion and what we teach in the classroom. In terms of, uh, like the book I wrote, uh, reaching a broader audience, uh, probably not. You know, the, um, uh, that kind of reading is, is, uh, is very limited. We don't have the kinds of uh, real progressive policies around taxes on books and so on. So book, average price of a book will be about 300 Rand. Uh, and we just don't seem to be able to get those things right. And as I say in, the, uh, in my book, over 75% of our schools don't have libraries. Mm. Uh, so it's about trying to evoke, and Neville Alexander and so on are part of a movement. It's trying to reach back into our rich history of resistance for the present challenges. Um, so, yeah, there is a, but having said that, I think there's a very critical, wonderful debate. Our debates are really not about whether Bob Diamond should go or not, or whether there should be another commission of inquiry, uh, you know, and, and a kind of state of denialism. Did Labour know? Did Conservatives know? You know, I thought if you deny the Holocaust, you go to jail, you know, but these guys just deny their own culpability. So it's that level of debate. But I think in South Africa, there's a deeper debate about our place in this global economy. And that's why people talk about national democratic revolution, two-state struggle, second transition. People are trying to grapple with this idea that you might have political power, CK the political kingdom first and all will follow, but what about economic power? And next year, we, we commemorate the 1913 Land Act. Well, those contour, uh, contours of our country are still in place, where 80% of the land is still owned by white people, and a lot of it lies barren and naked. And so uh, political power is starting to think about how you start to trespass onto economic power in the context of globalization. And so there are, are very vibrant debates taking place. But these debates must be informed by the kind of historical literacy. Sometimes what people want to impose a debate from the top. And for me, one of the mm. things about reading the book is this humbling that we've had these debates. We've thought about these things, about how we operate not only as a nation and nationalism, but even thinking beyond nationalism. And I think that's probably what the... Um... <laughs> but I, I mean, I think that's what this play does provoke in that it is talking about the voice of the, of the human being, the voice of the ordinary person, and that it's not just about those, isn't it, in the echelons of power that can make decisions, but it's about the individual empowering themselves. I mean, that's what I got from this. Do you know what? We're really running out of time. So, um, sorry? Uh. What was that? Yeah, so I was just saying, can we have, shall we say two last questions? Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I've been reminded of a great quote all night, which is, uh, men make history, but not necessarily under conditions of their own choosing, and both with Ashwin and the readings. I kept harkening back to that. So I've got a question for Matthew, and I hope Ashwin can comment, which is, did you have any trouble sort of reconciling... So it's a very liberating play, it seems, from the, from the readings, but reconciling the position the ANC have played today in keeping people poor, because, you know, you've just got different oppressors, basically, but people are still poor, um, with kind of the great figures at Robin Island, if that made sense. <laughs> Uh, oh, <laughs> um, I just write plays. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I definitely, I, 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 my understanding is when I talk to the politicians, the Andy Melanganis, the Ahmed Kathradas, those sorts, they, they 
they they stick to the party line and they and they you know they they say we're not there yet but we're getting there things are getting better when i talk to the sunnies and the sath coopers and they say what why why have i been in, why was i in prison for this long for this mm-hmm. you know so so i don't want to necessarily draw conclusions cuz i'm again new to south africa but i i see that comparison and i see that tension um, and that's what this play, I think, provokes, mm. is that tension. So I think that's all I'll probably say. Mm. Mm. Awesome. Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's a debate. I mean, you talk to people, people are very astute. They say people make history, but not under uh, circumstances chosen by themselves. And people in the ANC, for example, will argue that when they took power, it was times that they didn't choose. The Soviet Union had collapsed. The frontline states were under pressure. There was a neoliberal global world. There was, there was the power of the IMF and World Bank. And within that context of taking political power, but having not defeated the enemy militarily, compromises had to be made. And under those circumstances, very powerful things happen, would argue, and that people should have patience and these things, right? And other people argue that the whole history of the country has shown that this kind of voluntarism, the kind of fact, they will argue the last point, but people make history is the last sentence of that. Mm -hmm. And that we're not making history, but history has been made for us. Mm -hmm. And they become prisoners of of a global system. And that if we don't don't break out of that Washington consensus, then we can't deliver. That unemployment will increase. That inequality will will increase. And that unless there's a new imagination that emerges, um, we're in deep, deep, deep trouble. Uh, because the kinds of economic models that exist, our World Cup stadiums, lie empty and unused, and they drain money. Because, like, you know, it wasn't like the cargo cars where after the tr- World Cup, people arrive in their numbers to come to South Africa. And nobody could foresee maybe the European uh, recession and so on. So, there's, what I'm saying is that there is an openness to debate, there is, there is a sense that we could be reaching a cul de sac in, in the present trajectory, the present train that we're on is, is just not going to take us anywhere. And th- there's some people say, derail the train, yeah. right? And there's some people say, let's just get on the train and send it in another direction. These are contestations that are happening very, very powerfully and, and openly in South Africa. And one can choose, one can choose, and, I, and I, I'm sympathetic to both sides. One can choose to stand on the platform and, and, and scream against the train and throw, and throw stones against the train. One can, one can choose to try and derail the train, and one can choose to try and get on the train. These are challenges that we face in a very, very, very important time in South African history, because uneasy lies the crown that lies on the head. Yeah, yes, indeed. because the succession battles in South Africa. <laughs> exactly. Our high commissioner who was here, he knows that. He's also fought those battles with the basic income grant and so on. Some he's lost and some he's won. You know, he himself was part of those critical debates, and I'm glad he's gracing us tonight. So there, there's some, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm saying there's something very powerful, and there's an insurgency from below that is straining against what is. And those insurgent protests happening all the time. And people are saying that you can't spit on the very gospels that powered our struggle. You know, you, you can't say free water and then put a water meter. You can't say that Jesus won't overthrow the, 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 ta- the tables because he's scared what will happen to the money lenders and the markets. That you can't say that you won't ha- help the injured Jew because he doesn't have medical aid. That these were the things that powered the Freedom Charter and our struggles and they've been overturned in the New South Africa. People are making these very, very powerful arguments. People are saying that we don't want secrecy bills. That Robben Island was based on secrecy, cutting people off from information. And that, and in fact, that, that, that People treated the Robben Island preachers, people treated the waters with disdain and subverted them. And if today's liberators want to be today's waters, then we must treat them in the same way we must learn. So we, we learn from history and we take our powerful liberation history, not for nostalgia, not for, for saying and throwing our hands up in the air, but to fight. And on that note... <laughs> and I... I I can tell, I can tell that you're going to be stumbling all over yourselves to go and get the book. Do we remember that that is there on sale? Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you for an amazing evening. And thank you to yourselves. And make sure you have a safe journey home. Thank you. <laughs>